I wanted to talk about what's happening in Minnesota. I think it's really critical right now. And, and a lot of people don't understand this, but U.S. law is substantially different than Canadian law. Can you tell me the, the officers charged with third degree murder and manslaughter? How does that work? And what are the differences between the different degrees in the state of Minnesota? Okay, that's great, Dave. And, and frankly, I was curious. I wanted to learn my, more myself. Yeah. Because this is an opportunity to share it with everybody. Number one, why isn't there a charge of first degree murder? And I've done some checking. For US law, there's a procedure called a grand jury. You've heard about that. Mm -hmm. You cannot indict on first degree murder in Minnesota unless it's gone through a grand jury. So that's step number one, why it's not first. Um, and that's murder that's considered to be premeditated, if you can prove that. If it's not premeditated, but it's uh, certainly intentional killing, second degree murder, they could potentially indict on that. And certainly that difference, first degree life, no parole with uh, no eligibility for parole at all, or maybe no eligibility parole for 30 years. Second degree, maximum 40 years. So that's second degree. They could start with that and potentially then go to a grand jury and bump it up. And that may yet happen. Let's talk third degree because we don't have that in Canada. Third degree, the best comparable I could give you of Canadian justice is criminal negligence causing death. Here are the elements of third degree murder. Number one, you've done an act which is eminently dangerous to somebody else. And we can see what that act was. Then the issue is the intent. If it shows, they call it a depraved mind without regard for life, a depraved indifference. You do an act so dangerous, you knew death could potentially occur and you disregarded the risk. So no intent to kill, but doing an inherently dangerous act, act the risk, risk is really clear of death, and you proceed on anyway, that's your third degree murder. And so that's, that's an offense punishable by up to 25 years in jail. He's also charged with second degree manslaughter. That's a lower level. Consider that a high level of gross negligence. You're, you're running an unreasonable risk. You're taking a chance of death or grievous bodily harm, and you're proceeding anyway. So that's a, that's a lesser offense. In Canada, if you charged murder, you could have an included offense of manslaughter. So a jury could find not guilty murder, guilty manslaughter. I guess in the States, they need separate charges. So that's why we've got a separate charge. If a jury had a reasonable doubt on third degree murder but found there was enough for manslaughter, well, you want to make sure you got that coverage, you got both. So those are the elements of the offense of third degree murder. They clearly can go on with the investigation. And if they find they have more to be able to bump it up, they can. So that's the law in relation to him. If we've got time, we can talk parties to an offense next. Oh, we've got time. Oh, yes, we've absolutely got time. Yes. Because I can talk faster. No. Uh, anyway, <laughs> parties to an offense. And, I, and I'm going to give you my perspective. And I used to yes. be a, a prosecutor. Okay. If we talk about that, they have a concept, as we do in Canada, of aiding and abetting. And Mike, abetting isn't what you think. Oh. You are a better. <laughs> but a criminal liability would be an abetter. Oh. Okay, abetting in that context is encouraging. Aiding is doing or omitting to do anything for the purpose of assisting in the commission of the offense. So if we have the cop who's standing and keeping the crowd away and keeping them from intervening and looking back and seeing this show man with his knee on the guy's neck and in a position to hear the I can't breathe, you've got a reasonable case there to charge him as a party to third degree murder and second degree manslaughter. Because certainly he has the necessary knowledge, I would say. He can see what's going on, hear what's going on, and is preventing people from intervening. So you've got a case against him. The other two guys that are on the, the back and the legs of uh, Mr. Floyd, now, are they assisting in what's going on? Sure. Can you show they've got any knowledge of what the position was for Chauvin's knee on his neck? Are they in a position to hear the I can't breathe, any of that sort? So sure, they're helping. You may have more of a challenge showing what it is that you can show they know they are helping. Right, so right. So you may have them as parties, parties to manslaughter potentially. Do you have enough for parties to murder? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. That's what the state attorney general and the local DA are looking into. So now, the issues in relation to that, you don't want to jump to the wrong conclusion. If we have time next, we can talk forensic pathology, but those are the elements of the offense for it right now. Now, Dave, you brought up uh, while we were on about, I, th I believe the guy who was, you know, you mentioned in this, in this case, holding yeah. the people back and so on. Now, Dave, you had a, you, you brought up something uh, while we're during commercial. Why don't you say exactly uh, what that was? Yeah, Jeff, there's been a number of reports in the Minneapolis area, the police officer in the video uh, that was in front of uh, the officer kind of, kind of uh, blocking or trying to block cameras. He has fled 
the state of Minnesota and his whereabouts are unknown. Um, what does that exactly mean for him? Uh, obviously, in this situation, this could not be a good thing. Uh, but what are we anticipating here without knowing more information about this, except the fact that he has left the state of Minnesota and his lawyer does not know where he is? This we could call this criminal law 101 because there's a whole body of law of what's called post offense conduct. It used to be called consciousness of guilt. So if you flee the scene, if you destroy evidence, if you get people to lie, matters of that can, even, can provide evidence of a guilty conscience. conscience. Okay, a guilty state of mind. It could be considered to be an element of circumstantial evidence supporting a belief that the guy is guilty. Now, it's of what? Here, it may be somewhat ambiguous in terms of if you charge him, does that mean it's a guilty conscience for third degree murder or for second degree manslaughter? But in this particular case, it wouldn't really matter. The issue is his party liability. So could you use that? Sure. But he, on the other hand, could say, hey, I was afraid for my own security. People seem to know where I lived and I was worried with all the rioting and disruption that I felt concerned for my family, so I thought I'd hide out somewhere. Sure, but yet did he tell anybody like his lawyer, here's what I'm gonna go on concern for my safety. But he, so, so what we do as lawyers, we're often trained to allow for potential variable circumstances. We don't jump to the conclusion, ah, that's what it means, because there could be something else that could otherwise account for it. So what I'm giving you, Dave, is how it could be used by the prosecution, but how he could potentially respond. Now, looking at these circumstances that you've talked about and what they uh, eventually will, the, whatever the conclusion is, how long a trial could this be? What are we looking at in terms of its, of its length? Well, that, that leads to some extent, Mike, into the forensic pathology, because the state forensic pathologist focused particularly, I think he called it cardiopulmonary arrest, something in that regard, and talked about the underlying issues. The guy had some health concerns, was on medication. Uh, but certainly he characterized it as a homicide. But if we go back to our definition, would we say then that the act of kneeling on the guy's neck, part of the, the position would be that was a contributing feature, that was certainly a significant feature, that there was enough for causation, but what's the level of danger of the act if really the focus might be more on the cardi cardiopulmonary and drug-related issues? That kind of evidence could support more towards manslaughter, more towards third degree. You have a privately retained forensic pathologist said, no, right, right. it was as a result of asphyxiation, a compression of the carotid artery, kept oxygen from going to the brain, you know, and, and blood to the heart, or vice versa. Well, now that's an act which clearly is inherently dangerous. That's the kind of conduct that one could say is supportive of an argument of an intent to kill. Yeah. And so you could wind up in an unusual situation where, A, if the state proceeds with a more serious charge, they might wind up using the privately retained pathologist and the defense might use the state pathologist well, to try and argue a lower degree of liability. But Mike, that's the kind of stuff that could lead to a you know, longer trial. But here, the facts are substantial, not in dispute, because a lot of them are in video. When that information came across last night, and, I, and, and there was the, the, the two uh, pieces of evidence, one from the private and one from the, from the state, the state one had mentioned also, I guess in its toxicology, that there was fentanyl and I think methadone was also, but the, but the private one did not mention that. I mean, will they get to those kinds of details? Because I think they would be of significance. Sure. The issue then becomes, Mike, is it some of the background history that didn't play any part in the guy's death, or was it a contributing feature? So, for example, if we accepted the view that the cause of death was asphyxiation, whether you're asphyxiating somebody with fentanyl in the system or not, I can't breathe equals he is being killed. And on the issue of intent, the officer can hear him say, I can't breathe. Now, I've heard some suggestion, police evidence is he was saying, I can't breathe from before. And they might try and rely upon the I can't breathe from before as supporting the idea of the heart related issues, the fentanyl related issues. The officer, let's call it downplaying those comments. But a prosecutor could certainly take the, I can't breathe, knee on neck, several minutes, even if for a period of time after the guy's non-responsive, and build a case for intent and use evidence such as the privately retained pathologist to say, whatever the heart, whatever the drugs, the key here, the really principal cause was the situation. 